Dr Hewitt, we looked before lunch at the advice you received from Professor Len Doyle. Um, there's a letter then from Dr Knight mm -hmm. commenting on that advice to you. I'm not going to go through the detail of that. Um, for the transcript, it's NHBT 0004320, uh, and that was the 25th of January of 2000. Um, what I want to do is, however, turn up NHBT 0004364 underscore 004. Um, this is a letter of the 30th of January 2000 um, from uh, the chair of the uh, Lothian uh, Research Ethics Subcommittee, or the relevant subcommittee. Uh, um, addressed to Professor Will, who was conducting the TMER essentially with you, is that right? He was the surveillance unit... Principal investigator, yes. And you were the principal investigator yes. from the blood services yes. perspective. Uh, and we can see, um, uh, in, picking up in the second paragraph, it refers to the previous approval, the ethical approval, uh, um, that had been given by the committee... And then it says, crucially, you felt at that time that it would be inappropriate to contact either blood donors or recipients as it was felt unjustifiable to give these individuals information which might suggest that they're at risk of developing CJD. This decision was based on the fact that there is neither a test nor effective treatment for the disease. As you have indicated, this course of action appears to conflict with the stance adopted by the NBA as described in Dr. Hewitt's letter dated the 12th of October 1999. This is the position in relation to blood donors. I'm not going to go back through all the, the various bits and pieces of correspondence. Um, as you know, this followed a recommendation from MSBT that blood donations from individuals who'd received blood from donors who later developed NVCJD should not enter the blood supply. It seems to have been agreed that such a donation would be discarded and that the donor would be contacted and informed at a face-to-face -face interview that the blood could not be used and the reasons for the decision. Professor Doyle's letter to Dr. Hewitt, dated the 20th of December 1999, which is the letter we looked at before lunch, states that it would be immoral and illegal to act otherwise. He also clearly argues that the lack of an effective intervention is not justification for non-notification, stating that many terminally ill people both need and want to know information about their diagnosis and prognosis despite the absence of effective treatment. I would agree it's usually reasonable to tell someone that they're definitely terminally ill so that they may, as the saying has it, put their affairs in order. I know that we both feel that this is a far cry from being told there is a possibility which can be neither confirmed nor refuted that one may have been donated a virus which may or may not be responsible for causing a lethal illness at some undetermined time in the future. Nevertheless, a national policy with which the Department of Health is in agreement must be adhered to. As a consequence, I have no alternative to refuse your request for renewal of ethical approval for the above study. So the, the ethical approval was, I think, I think the phrase you've used in your statement was withdrawn. It, 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 all, it wasn't renewed, it doesn't, doesn't matter which. Mm. So as at the end of January 2000, the TMER no longer had the, the benefit of of the ethical approval that had been granted previously for the policy of non-notification. Agreed. Um, and then we can see uh, at NHBT 0004364 underscore 003 Professor Will wrote, um, copying you in, on the 1st of February 2000, to Dr. Ailsa White at the Department of Health, uh, says uh, in the first paragraph he refers to having written to the Local Ethics Committee. Uh, he refers then to the letter that we've just looked at, the refusal of the request to renew ethical approval. And then the next paragraph reads, as you may recall, I was very uneasy about the ethical situation in relation to this national study when approval had only been given by Local Ethics Committee. I contacted Dr. Metters about this, and I believe that a decision was made within the Department of Health that it was ethically appropriate for the study to continue under the original conditions. The situation is now very difficult. I believe that the look-back study in CJD addresses an issue of major public health importance, and I personally feel it would be irresponsible to discontinue this study because of the absence of local ethical approval. I would therefore seek your advice on how to proceed with this issue and whether it would be possible for the Department of Health to provide ethical approval for this national study. Um, 
Uh, do, do you know, Dr Hewitt, what, what then happened in relation to ethical approval or, or, and, and the Department of Health stance? I've been trying to remember, and I should know, but I can't remember. Okay. Well, I, I asked the question because I don't currently know the answer, but I'm sure we'll be able to trace it through with documents or, or, and, and or with other witnesses. Um, now, what, what you say in your statement is that ultimately over the following, I think it's three years, um, there was a, a shift in view um, leading to, as we'll come on to, notification then taking place to recipients at the very end of December 2003. Yes. Um, um, but it, it, it was 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, the position remained that uh, recipients were not, as a matter of fact, being notified. Yes, and there continued to be discussions at the CJD incident panel. And I, I think over that time, opinions changed, influenced by more up-to-date risk assessments uh, from the Department of Health analytical team, whose correct title I think Dr Williamson gave yesterday, but I can't remember. Um, I, I, we'll just pick up, I think, probably three documents that help understand what, yeah. some of what was happening during that time. But first of all, if we go to NHBT 0015384. So this is a letter, the 12th of January 2000, from Dr Mike McGovern uh, at the Department of Health to Dr Robinson. Um, it, it was in response to a letter that Dr Robinson had written to Dr McGovern, which is um, at pages three and four of this document, but I'm, I'm not going to go to that. Um, but it gives us an understanding, as at the beginning of 2000, of the position of MSBT. So uh, it refers in the first paragraph to MSBT discussing the management of donors known to have received blood from people who subsequently developed VCJD at the last meeting on the 28th of October 1999. This letter outlines that discussion and advice to the National Blood Authority, uh, and then he refers to his letter also providing a full reply to Dr. Robinson's letter of the 22nd of December. Uh, the next paragraph sets out uh, TMER, um, a summary of the TMER study, and then the last sentence of that paragraph, the question is whether these people's blood, should they present as donors in the future, be prevented from entering the blood supply, and if so, how the situation should be managed. Um, and then the next paragraph records a discussion about the position of flagging the donor databases, which you've already told us about. If we go over the page, um, the top of the page records that given that these people could present as donors in any of the UK countries, we agree that the flagging information should be shared by all four national blood services to ensure a coordinated, inclusive approach. So is it right to understand that the... The, the, the system of flagging was both agreed by the Department of Health and it was agreed that it should be a system that was shared between the four different blood services. Yes, it is. Um, and then the next paragraph deals with the position of what should happen if a flagged person gave blood. In the event of a flagged person giving blood, it was agreed that the donation identified through the flagging process should not be allowed to enter the supply. It was also agreed that in the spirit of openness and contracts with donors, the blood services would need to consider telling or offering to tell the donor why their blood could not be accepted. As, however, there's still little scientific knowledge to inform discussion with the donor, we agreed that the appropriate health department should be contacted in the first instance and that every such incident discussed and managed on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and then it refers to the MBA developing a protocol um, um, to deal with those cases. Uh, the next paragraph refers to the proposed expert group on the management of CJD incidents. That, I think, is a reference to what became the CJD incidents yes. panel, and we'll look at that um, shortly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was due to meet for the first time. Uh, and then the last paragraph reads as follows. It was clear from all the discussions that the decision to flag such potential donors was purely precautionary, not based on any new scientific information, and taken in the face of profound uncertainty. 
The most recent scientific opinion is that while blood may contain low levels of the infectious agent of CJD, blood components have never been identified as a cause of CJD in humans. The information on VCGD, however, is an evolution, and the position still is that there is no test for the agent. Even if there were, the implications of a positive test would be difficult to ascertain, and there are no known treatments for the disease. In addition, it's not known whether the agent can be transmitted by blood and cause disease in recipients. Because of this, our current policy remains that people who may have been exposed to the VCJD agent through blood or blood products should not be informed, as set out in Executive Letter PLC 0981, issued 6 February 1998. However, the policy will be kept under review in light of developing science, and lawyers will be seeking a council's opinion on the extent of our obligations towards those who may have been affected by implicated products. So it would appear, Dr Hewitt, from this letter, that as at January 2000, um, and leaving aside the position of flagged donors who then came to donate blood, the Department of Health's policy remained that there should be no notification. Yes, that's what this letter says, but I, I think earlier in the letter it said that the cases had to be decided on a, discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, I'd read it, but I may be wrong, and, and it may be that we'll have to ask the Department of Health about this, is the case-by-case -case basis would be how to deal with donors who attended, and that leaving aside the presentation of donors, the policy then remained non-notification non -notification for, the, for the whole group, yes. Um, so, so that, in, in any event, that's the position as at the yes. beginning of January. We then have the establishment of the VCJD, or the CJD incidents panel, and in due course, I think it was in October 2001, the panel initiated a consultation process, yes. did they not? Yes. And the question of notification was one of the issues of, yes. on which consultees' views were sought. Um, and we can look at that at NHBT 0096710 underscore 001, please. Um, so we can see from uh, this uh, document dated the 10th of October 2001, uh, this covering notice uh, is from the chair of the CJD Incidents Panel, Michael Banner. I'm writing as the chair of the CJD Incidents Panel to seek your views on the enclosed document entitled Management of Possible Exposure to CJD Through Medical Procedures. The CJD Incidents Panel was set up last year by the Chief Medical Officer to advise on these issues. The document has been drawn up in the knowledge that there is an unknown but possible risk that CJD could be transmitted through surgical instruments, donated blood, or other tissues or organs from individuals who later develop CJD. These risks are very hard to evaluate but cannot be ruled out. The document sets out proposals for managing incidents of possible exposure to CJD. The panel's proposals address such matters as informing people who have potentially been exposed and how to deal with the surgical instruments that may have been used. It takes into account as best we can the current state of knowledge about the risks of transmission. It also attempts to chart a way forward in handling the difficult ethical dilemmas which arise in dealing with a disease which is always fatal, for which there is no cure, which has an unknown incubation period and no diagnostic test. Um, and then if we go, first of all, in this document to page 61... We can see that the panel had a, a broad membership um, and it included, amongst others, Professor Ironside from the uh, National CJD Surveillance Unit, Professor Len Doyle, the ethicist from whom you'd sought advice, uh, and you, um, a, a, yes. a, along with a list of other names. If we could then please go back to page six. Just picking it up in the third paragraph, we see the description of risk there. The risk of transmitting CJD through medical interventions is not fully understood. And this document has been prepared in the face of great scientific uncertainty. And then if we go to the next page, we can see in broad terms the issues upon which views were being sought. Top of the page, it's possible that variant and sporadic CJD may be transmitted on surgical instruments used on patients incubating the disease. 
or in blood, other tissues or organs donated by individuals incubating the disease. These risks are unknown, but current procedures for decontaminating surgical instruments between uses cannot be guaranteed to eliminate the abnormal prion proteins that are thought to be responsible for the transmission of CJD. In addition, while there is evidence that sporadic CJD is not transmitted in blood, less is known about variant CJD. Therefore, transmission of variant CJD in blood cannot be ruled out. Um, so, uh, would, would, would you see that, again, as a reflection of the precautionary principle, that rather than waiting until there is positive evidence of, a, of transmission by blood, here is the panel identifying measures that could be implemented at a stage where it, it, it's not known, still less proved, that trans transmission takes place? Yes. <coughs> And then we can see, um, just above the first uh, heading one, it says, the panel proposes four main courses of action. One, removing the instrument slash blood products from use. This protects public health while the risks are being assessed. The panel may advise that instruments are destroyed or that they're unlikely to pose a risk to the public and may be returned to use. The panel will also advise <coughs> on the removal from use of blood, uh, or blood or plasma products donated by people who later develop CJD. Two, setting up a confidential database of all possibly exposed people. And then over to page three, informing some individuals about their exposure to CJD. The exception to this would be a small subgroup of possibly exposed people who the panel considers to be at sufficient risk to warrant public health action. It is proposed that these people are contacted, sorry, I should have read the, the to make sense of it. I, I'm trying to go too quickly. If we go to the top of the page. So um, we pick it up at the top of the page. It's proposed that most people would not be informed about their possible exposure. Um, and then the reasons are there set out. Then the next paragraph says um, there's a strong arm, argument that people should be able to choose whether or not they're told about their possible exposure. Therefore, it's proposed that possibly exposed people are not asked for their informed consent before being recorded on this mm -hmm. register. This is because such action would remove the choice of not being told about their exposure. Instead, it's proposed that individuals who wish to know if they're on the database and the details and significance of their exposure should be able, after appropriate counselling, to obtain the information through the doctor. And then three, the exception to this would be a small subgroup of possibly exposed people who the panel considers to be at sufficient risk to warrant public health action it's proposed that these people are contacted and informed about their exposure so that they can be advised not to donate blood or organs and to contact their doctor if they require surgery in the future. Um, and then four was about publicity about the database. So th that's the way in which at this stage the panel contemplated addressing the issue of notification. Is that right? That's right. That's right. It was, it was essentially escalating uh, actions for a small group of potentially exposed people and not for the majority. Um, but it, 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 there would be a choice then, is this right, for the majority to be able to find out... That was the intention. That was the intention. That, um, that wasn't what was then put in place, is that right? That's correct. Um, so that's the position then as at October 2001. The consultation then took place. Um, we, we don't have all the documents available to, to, to display with you, Dr. Hewitt, but in any event, we can pick that up, I think, with other witnesses. Um, and you tell us in your statement that um, eventually the decision was made um, that patients considered at risk should be notified. So there was a reversal of the original policy of non-notification of those recipients who'd been identified through the TMER. Yes, so it was the patients who'd received transfusions from individuals who later developed variant CJD. Um, and, and we can, I think, look at that um, uh, and because it's set out in a later letter, which just gives us some of the, the dates of the decisions, at PRIU 5015. Um, 
This is a letter from the Department of Health. It's from the then Minister of State, Caroline Flint, October 2006, to a coroner who'd undertaken an investigation into um, the death um, of someone who had died following um, BCJD transmitted through blood. Um, the purpose for looking at it is just if we go over to the second page, um, we can see the decision-making process set out. Um, uh, so if we pick it up in the third line, sorry, second line, it says there's been a general shift in attitudes towards patients' rights to information. In the summer of 2000, the Department of Health established the CJD Incidents Panel the panel was asked to advise healthcare professionals on the management of incidents involving potential transmission through medical interventions. And then it refers to um, the consultation process. It says it included a public meeting held in April 2002. There was a wide range of views expressed. And then if we go to the next paragraph, the panel revised its proposals in the light of the consultation responses, recommending that patients considered at risk should be notified and that necessary support mechanisms should be in place. So that, in due course, was the, the recommendation post-consultation of the CJD Incidents Panel to the Department of Health. That's right. That notification for those categories of patients should now take place. And then it says the four chief medical officers for England and the devolved administrations accepted this proposal in June 2003. It's right, as I understand it, Dr Hewitt, that although that proposal was accepted in June 2003, no steps were taken at that point to notify recipients. I'm not aware that any steps were taken. C could I, I just yes. clarify the very first sentence in this letter? Of course. Because it might be confusing for some individuals. The original letter wasn't to me. Yes, it was to my right. alter ego. Yes, yes. It so it was written to the department to the, to the Minister, of State of Secretary of State of Health, yes. Yes, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so if we just go back to the second page. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think it was a source of frustration for the incident panel uh, that following uh, agreement with the recommendation in June 2003, there was no information that, that uh, something was being set up. Um, and the letter continues, at this time, there were still no known cases of BCJD transmission by a blood transfusion. However, while the necessary support mechanisms were being put in place, the first case of BCJD transmission by blood transfusion was confirmed in December 2003. The department acted as quickly as possible to ensure that all similar recipients were contacted and given the information and support needed. Now, you observed in your witness statement, um, uh, um, uh, if we look at WITN 31010009, please, Paul. Page 140. Uh, it's paragraph 393, so bottom half of the page. Um, uh, uh, last few lines of paragraph 393. I understand that notification was advised. Action was not taken until December 2003 when the recognition of the first possible link occurred. DH then instructed that notification should take place. And that resulted in notifications being sent out essentially at, uh, around the, the time of Christmas New Year. Um, and, and as I, I'm sure you're aware, Dr Hewitt, um, the evidence, the inquiry has heard of in, in an individual case from Peter Buckland, who was the father of yes. Mark Buckland, um, was a, a letter from the Health Protection Agency dated the 31st of December 2003, arriving in early 2000, January 2004. Um, from, from your perspective, could the notification process have taken place, so could and should the notification process have taken place earlier than the end of December 2003? Yes. I was quite clear about that, and it was an example of how not to do a notification exercise. The, the time was awful. 
um, individual GPs and local public health teams were put in the position of this is something you must do now without any plans really having been made in place. A lot of work was done, a lot of teleconferences with a lot of people working out how it could be done uh, well and quickly and that really wasn't the situation it, we should have been in. And it, uh, is it the case that, that the agency that took the lead in the notification process was the Health Protection Agency? That's correct. I was involved in that Clearly, the blood service held the details of the individuals who, who were, were to be informed. And I did take part in a lot of the teleconferences, but the, the notification was handled by the public health teams. Um, now, part of, of Mr. Buckland's evidence um, um, was an expression of concern about the fact that his son's um, exposure had been known about for uh, a number of years, but had not been communicated to his son until the notification exercise that you've just described. Yes. And I'm not asking for comments on, on, on individual cases, but I just wanted to invite your comment on um, one of the reasons Mr Buckland articulated as to why it would have mattered to his son to know. Uh, and he said it's because he could have made a choice to live his life to the full in a way he what remained of his life of his young life to the full in a way that he couldn't because he didn't know um, that he had possibly been exposed as a matter of fact had had indeed been exposed to bcjd again as, as a and that perhaps picks up upon some of the observations professor doyle was making would you agree with that as a, as a matter of principle that that's a, one of the considerations that would um favour notification rather than non-notification? I totally agree. And <coughs> if I may be allowed to say, the first case which, which initiated this exercise, the case where a recipient did develop variant CJD uh, and hadn't been informed. Um, equally, um, I did meet some of the family, and very rightly made the comment that if they had known that their family member was at risk, he died without a diagnosis being made. If they had known that he had been at risk, his last few months and would have been dealt with differently, and how they had managed the situation would have been dealt differently because they would have known what they were dealing with, or what they were likely to be dealing with. And there's an observation you've made more generally in your statement, Dr. Hewitt. Um, if we can have the statement back, please. WITN 3101009. And we go to... Sorry, I think that might be the wrong reference. Forgive me. It might be your other statement. Let me check. Sorry, Paul. WITN 3101006, page 34. Um, this is paragraph 105, uh, and you're here reflecting on, on issues of, I think, more broadly of, of, of notification. You say this, with hindsight, I think the difficult issues and strongly held views from both sides those who supported notification of the possibly affected despite the potential for psychological harm and those who felt that such harm outweighed the benefits may have led to erring on the side of not acting soon enough to impart potentially devastating news in terms of possible exposure to HCV and VCJD. And does, does, that, does that accurately reflect your view? Yes, yes. Um, can I then just pick up a ha on a handful of other matters relating to VCJD? So we've, we've learnt that the December 2003 was when an individual died of VCJD who'd received a transfusion some years earlier, including a blood component originating from a donor who later developed VCJD. Yes, that's correct. That was the confirmation, is that right, essentially? Um, it was the likely evidence, but one case... Um I know 
I know that the Department of Health were very anxious that it couldn't be called evidence. It was suggestion of a possibility. And it wasn't until the subsequent cases that gave definitive evidence that we could say with confidence we, we do have the evidence that it is transmitted through uh, blood components. Um, but we can see this, this case being uh, described in an article in The Lancet um, in February 2004, uh, co-authored by, by, by you, Dr Knight and, 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 and Professor Will and others, WITN 3101018. You're setting out here more fully, as I understand it, what you've learned from the TMER by this stage. This was a description of this first case. Um, so if we look at the heading summary um, and go to methods, um, so that that's describing, uh, I, I think, the TMER. Yes. And then findings, 48 individuals identified as having received a labile blood component from a total of 15 donors who later became VCJD cases and appeared on the surveillance unit's register. So as at the date of, of this article, yes. TMER had, had identified 48 people. Yes. And then one of these recipients was identified as developing symptoms of VCJD six and a half years after receiving a transfusion of red cells donated by an individual, individual three and a half years before the donor developed symptoms of VCJD. So that's the, the case that you've described, yes, the individual. Yes. And perhaps it would be helpful to say that because of the, the time of this, it was non leuka depleted red cells. Um, and then interpretation, our findings raise the possibility that this infection was transfusion uh, transmitted. Um, and then if we go to page four, um, you, you set out various um, further details about that, that individual case, but I'm just going to draw attention to the last paragraph of the article, so halfway down the right-hand column. Our report suggests that human prion diseases may be transmissible through blood transfusion and underlines the importance of epidemiological surveillance systems. Although experimental studies are important, only through the study of natural disease can evidence of an actual iatrogenic risk be identified. Risk of VCJD is not restricted to the UK, and the identification of cases of VCJD and examination of history of blood donation may be important in other European countries and elsewhere. Um, so you go on in um, your witness statement to tell us that two further cases were, were then identified linked to a common donor, and that that essentially confirmed the link. Yes between VCJD and, and blood transmission. Um, and I should just say, I, I don't think I need to go to it, but there's a, there was an ad hoc meeting held on the 15th of December 2003 to discuss what should happen when the case came to light. Yes. I'll give the reference for the transcript, DHSC 00068270006. And... Um, can we then look at RLIT 0000777? Four zeros, I'm not sure if I've given too many there, 777. So this is from the website of um, the uh, CJD surveillance unit. Uh, and if we go to, oh no, it's not got the page I wanted. I don't think it's printed out as we needed it. Um, no, don't worry. Um, what my understanding, and this is what you say in your witness statement, uh, so we can take the document down, um, is that uh, TMER identified 67 people at risk of VCJD because they'd received a blood component originating from a donor who later developed VCJD. Yes. Is that right? Um, 
And then in terms of the notification process, we've learnt how the initial notification process was handled by the Health Protection Agency. But you've told us in your statement that there was then a 2005 notification procedure in relation to donors identified through the reverse TMER, which was managed by you. Yes. So wh why was this undertaken in a different way? Uh, so just to be clear, so this is uh, the situation where a recipient has developed variant CJD and we have identified the donors whose blood uh, had been transfused to those recipients. So those donors were considered to be at risk. And the decision was then taken that those donors should also be notified and told that they should not continue to give blood um, or donate other tissues or organs. And at the time, we felt very strongly that these were individuals whose risk for variant CJD had been identified because they were blood donors, because they'd volunteered to give blood. And we felt that it was our responsibility as the blood service to give them the information and that outsourcing it to another organisation might seem very strange. I'm not sure whether that was correct or not, but that was what we felt very strongly at the time, that, that it was our responsibility to talk to our donors. And now notification of, of at risk um, or being at risk of uh, for those who'd received fractionated products so factor concentrates we, we've heard evidence already in the, in the inquiry from um, Professor Hay and others about the mm. notification exercises that were undertaken first of all um, was the, the, were the blood services involved in that exercise um, Indirectly, um, as part of the whole procedure, the blood service had notified BPL or the Scottish equivalent of plasma donations which had originated from donors who'd later developed variant CJD. And I had made myself a note to say that although plasma product recipients were not included in the TMER, there was a, diff a separate exercise to identify what had happened to those implicated plasma products. Um, which is now what we're talking about. So the blood services provided the information to the fractionators so they could identify which batches of products contained uh, plasma from those original donations. Um, and thereafter, the only part that the blood service was involved in is where there were... where there were... Uh, batches of albumin, which is a, a protein solution, which had been used within the transfusion service because th the transfusion service provides a therapeutic service for some patients who require plasma exchange. So we were the users of the products at that stage. But that was the, as far as I recall, that was the only involvement of the blood services. You, you yourself might have had some knowledge of what was going on because of your involvement with yes. the CJD Instance yes, Panel. Yes, um, but, but we can pick that up, I think, yes. through the CJ Instance Panel minutes as a matter of record. Um, but but um, that notification exercise was then handled, um, as it were, through the CJD Instance Panel and the Haemophilia Centre Directors' Organisations. Um, your understanding? It, it was actually handled by um, Public Health... Whatever, Public Health England, whatever its current title was at that time, um, who... Um, provided the risk calculations for the various batches and then informed users of which batches were, were at risk. And then you referred a moment or two ago to there being an equivalent, to, as it were, of TMER, but in relation to the fractionated products, so the same kind of exercise being undertaken. Who... who who, as far as you know, undertook that? So that's what we were just talking about, yes. So it was the Public Health uh, team, Public Health England, it was the headquarters, with the haemophilia centres okay. and with other users of other products. Um, so those... Oh, no, no, there's a couple of further questions in relation to VCGD, sorry. Um, th that, that was the system in relation to notification. In terms of other measures that the blood services were involved in, 
The issue of leukotriene depletion, Dr. Williamson addressed, I don't propose to ask you about that. Um, but the other measures taken in response to the possibility of transmission of, of BCJD primarily concerned donor exclusion policies, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. And if we look at DHSC 0038574 underscore 038, Um, we can see this is a document, um, it, it bears your name in, at the bottom and the date of the 20th of December 2000, ethical position and policy on informing donors and recipients about matters relating to VCJD or CJD, and then I'm, I'm not going to re go over again the ethical issues about notification, but in terms of donor exclusions, we can see the first paragraph explains that a variety of individuals identified as being at risk of CJD are excluded from blood donation in the UK. The categories of the exclusion are as follows. Individuals who've been treated with pituitary hormones before 1985, corneal transplant recipients, individuals with a family history of CJD, individuals who've had brain surgery or an operation for a tumor or cyst on the spine before August 1992. So th those are four categories who by 2000 had been excluded. And these all related to sporadic or familial CJD? Um, and then, um, as, as you've, uh, we've seen from the documentation in relation to the notification decision making, there was the flagging exercise to ensure that donors um, who'd been identified through the TMER work did not have their donations used. Yes. Um, and then, um, if we go to DHSC 0004555 underscore 008. If we go to the next page. Um, yep, so if we look at that box on the top of the page, from the 5th of, so a new rule for blood donors, from the 5th of April 2004, we can no longer accept blood donations from people who've received blood during the course of any medical treatment or procedure in the UK since the 1st of January 1980. Um, and then below that, so below the box, we're sorry we've had to ask you to stop giving blood for the time being. This new rule has been introduced as a purely precautionary measure in light of the latest scientific information. Our aim is to ensure that patients always receive blood and blood products that are as safe as we can make them. In this instance, we're reducing the possible risk of VCJD being passed from donor to patient. So was this the next step, as it were, in, in the development of, of donor exclusion policies? to deal with the possible risk of VCJD. Yes, uh, and again, it, it's the precautionary principle, but it was to avoid the possibility of recycling of infection through blood, for going from one person to another and then to another. So it wouldn't have eliminated the initial risk, but it would eliminate the further risk of it being passed on again. So those are the questions I have for Dr. Hewitt. Um, over lunch, I've been sent a number of additional questions from core participants for me to consider, but rather than do that now, I wonder if we could take a shortish break. I can read the last of the questions I didn't have a chance to read, and core participants can suggest any further questions arising out of the last 45 minutes or so of Dr. Hewitt's evidence. Uh, yes, sir. How long do you think you might be? I think 15 minutes would be, would be fine. Or... Very well. We'll meet again at 3 o'clock, shall we? 3 o'clock. <laughs>